The next hypothesis test that we're going to learn about is called a one-sample t-test. This is the type of t-test that you would be more likely to run. I've shown you how to do something very similar using a z-test, but the fact is we use t-tests much more frequently than we use z-tests, and that is because in the real world, it is highly unlikely that we know the standard deviation of the population. A one-sample t-test can be conducted when we don't know the population standard deviation. Let's begin by learning what a one-sample t-test is all about. A one-sample t-test is a parametric procedure. It tests whether a sample mean is statistically significantly different than a population mean, when the standard deviation of the population is unknown. Using our example with the polar bears, the population of polar bears walks 100 miles per week, but we don't know the population standard deviation. We have randomly selected a sample of polar bears that were given caffeine. And at the end of this study, they walked an average of 150 miles per week. We can use what we learn from the sample standard deviation to estimate the population standard deviation. However, this changes the nature of the test and is going to be dependent upon the sample size. The basic setup for a one-sample t-test works like this. We have a sample that has been drawn from the population. Our dependent variable is a scale measure of this sample. We know the mean of the population, and of course we know the mean and standard deviation of the sample because we can compute that. However, we do not know the standard deviation of the population. We're going to need to estimate that from our sample. The independent variable is one sample, which is categorical data. This sample has been randomly selected from the population. The dependent variable is a scale level variable with a mean. The mean of the population is known or estimated, but the standard deviation of the population is unknown. Every test is built on certain assumptions. We need to check our data to make sure they meet the assumptions for the one-sample t-test. The first assumption is no extreme outliers. If there are outliers that are causing a problem, we will need to exclude them or perhaps Windsorize those outliers. A second assumption is that there is no missing data in our data set. If there is, we might need to impute. The third assumption is that the dependent variable data are independent. Scores in one part of our sample are not influencing scores in another part of the sample. And the fourth assumption, the dependent variable is normally distributed to meet the assumption of normality. If we test our dependent variable and it is not normally distributed, we need to make sure that we're using a large enough sample that we can satisfy the assumption of normality based upon the central limit theorem and our distribution of sample means. The statistical settings for a one-sample t-test work like this. Our null hypothesis is that the sample mean is the same as the population mean from which it was drawn. The sample mean is no different than the population mean. We would write this as h sub zero colon mu equals mu sub zero. However, we're going to take the actual population value, which we know, and substitute that population mean where you see mu sub zero. The alternative hypothesis would be written as h sub one colon mu does not equal mu sub zero, where we will again substitute the actual population mean. The alpha level is typically set to 0.05. However, with a t-test, we have something we did not have with the z-test, the degrees of freedom. We're using degrees of freedom because we are estimating the population standard deviation, which leaves us with one less value free to vary. The degrees of freedom for a t-test is n minus one, the sample size minus one. Our critical value will therefore be based on the number of degrees of freedom and our alpha level. We will look up a critical value in student's t-distribution table, which has been included in your course notes.
For any test that we do, unless you are instructed otherwise, it is safe to assume that we are doing an alpha 0.05 two-tailed test. And let me show you the data that we're going to be testing with our new t-test. We read an article in Martha Stewart Correctional Quarterly reporting that the national average score for women on a test of indoor gardening is 71. We replicate the study with 28 randomly selected men and compare their sample mean of 68.56 to the population mean for women. We are going to begin with a null hypothesis that the men's mean is actually 71 that although it does look slightly different, it does not in fact differ from the population mean of 71. We are now going to walk through the first three steps of hypothesis testing. This will allow us to set up our test. Then we're going to learn how to do this test using statistical software. Step number one is to select the appropriate statistic. And this is always the easiest step when we're learning a new test because the answer is always whatever test we're learning right now. Given what you know about our data, what test are you going to select for this example? We will use a one sample t-test. Step number two is to select the null and alternative hypothesis. Our null hypothesis will be h sub zero colon mu equals 71. Where did that 71 come from? That is the mean of the population. I have simply plugged in that value for our null hypothesis. And you will see that same value again with our alternative hypothesis. The alternative hypothesis is written as h sub 1 colon mu does not equal 71. The fact that our null and alternative specify equal and not equal tells us that we are using a two-tailed test. We will use the typical alpha level of 0.05. And our degrees of freedom is the number of participants minus one. With 28 men in our sample, we have 27 degrees of freedom. And now we need to look up the critical value for this t-test in student's t-distribution table. I have included an example of this table in your course notes. You can also find the same kind of table all over the internet if you need to look for one. On the last page of your course notes, you will find this table. Notice that there are two major columns. The one to the left is for two-tailed tests. The one to the right is for one-tailed tests. Let's focus just on the two-tailed tests. In this big column, we see two sub-columns, one for an alpha level of 0.05 and the other for an alpha level of 0.01. Running down the column under the DF, we see numbers, one, two, three. These are the degrees of freedom. And we have 27 degrees of freedom, so we're gonna need to scroll down this table. In the first column, we find that for 27 degrees of freedom, alpha 0.05 two-tailed test, our critical value is positive negative 2.052. If we calculate a T value in excess of this critical value, we have established statistically significant differences between the means. Now to do that, we're ready for step four. We're gonna calculate the statistics, and now we do that using our statistical software. You can choose which statistical software you use to run this test. However, by way of example and explanation, I wanna show you some output using JASP so that we can see how to interpret these findings. We want to check our assumptions. We can check the assumption of normality using a Shapiro-Wilk test. And anytime we are checking for assumptions, we want the test to be non-significant, meaning that our data do not differ from the assumptions of the test. In this case, the assumptions test is non-significant. We can find our descriptive statistics in the box labeled descriptives, and this will be the case regardless of the type of software that you're using. We'll use these descriptive statistics in the write-up.
And here's how we would interpret the actual test. There are three measures that we could look for. When we looked up our critical value in student's T table, we determined that for 27 degrees of freedom, our critical value would be 2.052. However, our T score is 2.5, which exceeds 2.0. In this case, our T value is negative, but that only means that our sample mean is less than our population parameter. The negative or positive t-tests can be interpreted in the same way, and many times I simply report the values as positive regardless of what the t-value was in the statistical software. A second way that we can determine statistical significance is looking whether our p-value is less than 0.05. In this case, it is a 0.015, which is less than 0.05. And we can look for the confidence interval around the mean difference to see that both values are negative. They're both on the same side of zero. Our confidence interval does not include zero. If one value was positive and the other was negative, that confidence interval would include zero. All three of these findings tell us exactly the same thing. This is a statistically significant t-test. And here is an example of how we might write up our findings in APA style. A one sample t-test was conducted to determine whether men score differently than women on a test of indoor gardening, the population mean being 71. The mean scores for men were 68.56 with a standard deviation of 4.98, were statistically significantly lower than for women. T with 27 degrees of freedom equals 2.59. Probability rounded to 0 0.02, our 95% confidence interval, and our Cohen's D effect size. This suggests a gender difference in gardening skills.